welcome to Creative Piecemeal Podcast, a podcast for creatives. I'm your host, Tammy Takeishi. Join me for compelling conversations with artists, actors, authors, musicians, and other creatives about the impact of the creative and fine arts in their lives and our ever-changing world. Thank you for listening. Hello, welcome to Creative Piecemeal Podcast. I'm your host, Tammy. Today, I am joined by Erin Lowry. She's a writer, speaker, author, and author coach, known for her Broke Millennial book series that helps break down the mysteries and intricacies of finance, from budget basics to investing in more. And her goal is to spread financial literacy and help people understand the importance of financial health. I personally picked up her first book, broke millennial during the pandemic. I actually was one of a few different financial books because I thought, well, we're in a pandemic. What better time to start getting my finances in order? And I absolutely love the like straightforward and very relatable. And it's um, for anyone, well, even if you're not a millennial, if you're elder millennial or on either side of those generations, it's definitely a fantastic book, great book series. So pick those up wherever you get your books. And Erin, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited because as a person in the creative arts, um, most people in the creative arts have a lot of finance questions because we're not really taught those sort of things in music school or art school or anything like that. Uh, They're sort of creeping their way in a little bit, um, but certainly not when I went to school. So we all kind of just figure it out. (laughs) So we'll, we'll have a few very specific questions later on in the show, but we're going to start with who or what inspired you to become an author and a book coach and a speaker? Well, this is always the fun part where I'm like, you know, you would think a decade into doing this, I would have like a really succinct 30 second elevator pitch about my story. And yet I don't. And for me, a big part of it is it, it sort of depends on which sort of inciting incident or inflection point you want to focus in on. But I think what's important for all of the listeners to know is that I am a journalism and theater double major. I did not study business. I did not study finance. I did not study accounting. I never worked at a bank. I never worked on Wall Street. Like all those traditional hallmarks of being somebody who professionally gives people money advice, I don't have. And a big part of the reason that I like to actually call myself when I'm speaking specifically about my work as quote unquote broke millennial, I like to consider myself a financial translator. And I say that because one, I go out and to sort of lean on my journalism degree, I go out and interview very smart, very experienced people, preferably people who have decades of experience in these fields, because when we're looking at moments like I don't know, a major looming recession or a suddenly tanking stock market. Financial professionals who are 35 years old have barely experienced a big recession or a big tumble in the market. And not that that, I should say, feel free to trust your 35-year-old financial professional, the 35-year-old CFP. But speaking to a 60-year-old who has been through the ringer a few times is able to give you a lot more context and insights, and they've weathered the ups and downs a little bit more. So I go out and interview all of these folks. But let me tell you, it's jargon filled. Like when you're talking to financial professionals, it just is going to be jargon. And what I like to consider my job is to demystify it, kind of put it through a translator and figure out how to make these stories relatable, accessible, understandable for your average consumer. And I feel obviously particularly strongly for creatives as someone who comes from that background myself. And I particularly feel really strongly because I think a lot of us have been done a disservice of being told that your art is really only pure if you're like a starving artist, if you're not making a whole lot of money from it, which I have a whole lot of conflicting and very strong emotions about, we can get into later. 
But this is all being a very long windy way of saying my background really is fundamentally in storytelling, journalism or theater. That's basically what both of those things are. And I love being able to tell stories around money because I feel like it is the stronger way to hook people in and to leave you with a longer lasting impression as opposed to here's the basic formulas that you need to understand compound interest and why compound interest is important to you and impactful in your life, whether you have debt or whether you're investing. And I read a few other books by some other people as well in the industry. And I kept coming back to yours because it was, it was exactly the sort of road that, that I needed. And I think what a lot of people need, and you have other books, Broke Millennial Takes on Investing, Broke Millennial Talks Money. Would you like to tell our listeners a little bit more about those? Sure. Well, the whole series I like to think about as a progression of your financial life. So Broke Millennial, Stop Scraping By and Get Your Financial Life Together is obviously the very first book in the series that focuses on what I would consider the foundations of building a strong financial life. And you really have everything in there from here's how to build a budget to here's how to pay off debt. To here's how to handle student loans. And then you start to also get a very small smattering of like, hey, I can't afford to split this dinner bill evenly, or, Hey, how do I get financially naked with a partner or, Oh my goodness, I'm so stressed out at the idea of investing. And those were just like tiny little smatterings of chapters. But I noticed that those were also chapters where I started to get a lot of follow-up questions because a lot of the basics are truly, truly covered in that book, credit scores, debt payment, you know, how to start saving better and people get the foundation and then they want to level up. And in that book, I reference a few investing books. I'm like, hey, like here's the one investing chapter, very focused on investing for retirement. If you want to learn more, and then I listed a few like very classic, iconic investing books. And within, I want to say a month of my first book coming out, I started getting emails and DMs that were like, hey, checked out the books you recommended. They seem still like pretty complicated, anything simpler, which is fair. Like they are still fairly complicated because even a lot of beginner books are already talking to you as if you understand the basic language of investing. So it'll be like, all right, and then we're going to take some index funds and create a diversified portfolio. And you're like, I'm sorry, I understand individually what those words mean, but together in a sentence, I have now completely lost you. And I pitched to my uh, publishing house and like, hey, um, starting to get a lot of questions about investing. I think there's actually a big missed opportunity in the market here to have a true beginner's guide to investing. And that's really what I wrote. Not only the second chapter is all about like, here are terms you need to know. Like it is just a dictionary, the second chapter of that book. But more importantly too, it approaches investing from a very millennial centric standpoint and like, how do we think about apps? What do we think about robo advisors? Should I even be investing if I'm paying off student loans or other types of debt? All of these topics that you are not going to see in random walk down wall street and these other very iconic, very good, but slightly more advanced investing books. And then when it came to my third book, Broke Millennial Talks Money, Scripts, Stories, and Advice to Navigate Awkward Financial Conversations, which is the longest subtitle you've ever heard. It's epic. I love it. (laughs) It is. It's it's a mouthful. But that to me is actually, don't tell the others, my favorite in the series, because I have really come to realize, and for context, at the time of this recording, I'm 33 years old. And, you know, I've been through now the process of like, everyone around you getting married and how much it costs to go to other people's weddings. I live in New York city. No one gets married here. Every single wedding is a trip. And then you got the bachelorette parties and the bridal showers and all the things on top of it. I don't live near my family or my in-laws. So every holiday, every family function, it's traveling. I live in a very expensive city. Everybody, you know, goes out. We don't really socialize in our homes all that much. So it's all about going out, going to brunch, going to drinks, going to concerts, going to shows, which sounds epic, but it's so expensive. And it's really, really critical to learn how to communicate about money and set boundaries around money, because fundamentally it is so easy to let other people spend your money. And I have really realized over the last decade of writing about money that that really ends up kind of being a huge through line in people's pain points 
is how do I set clear and concise boundaries or navigate potentially very uncomfortable financial situations with people in my life? So the book is cut up into four big sections, work, how do you ask your coworkers how much they make? How do you negotiate? All of those kinds of things. Friends, I can't afford to split this dinner bill evenly. My friends and I now make massively different amounts of money. How do I handle that? Family, are you your parents' retirement plan? How to talk to your parents about aging and estate planning, as well as like, should you loan your siblings money? What is that gonna look like if you do? And then finally, romantic partners. So all of the conversations around should I help my partner pay off their debt before we're married? Should we be getting a prenup? Spoiler alert, yes, you should. So all of these different topics also around romantic partners. So the book is in four big sections. And I always say, I'm betting at least two sections are relevant to your life at any given time. Excellent. I have not had a chance to pick that one up yet, but I feel like it's, as you said, relevant at any given time. And I'm even hearing you talk about it. I'm like, oh yeah, I, I definitely can. I'd use that one chapter there, you know? So So obviously being that you have written books, I'm, you probably read a lot and you coach a lot. What is a book recently? And it doesn't necessarily have to be financially based, but that you couldn't put down. Oh, so I actually really am a sucker for essayists. So I love all sorts of books. But oftentimes if I'm reading for pleasure, I tend to not be reading necessarily in like the self-help genre, whether it's money or other types of self-improvement, because I feel like I'm inundated with that all day at work. David Sedaris, obviously being iconic, but also any celebrity memoir, even like if I don't really care that much about the celebrity, I just find celebrity memoirs fascinating. (laughs) And I think so much of it has to do too with trying to see a trajectory of where somebody's life changed and how they were able to achieve what they achieved. I just fundamentally find very interesting, particularly if they come from backgrounds where maybe there wasn't a lot of support for their creative endeavor, particularly like actor memoirs, big fan. So yeah, I'd say I read some David Sedaris earlier this year. Um, I think it was Me Talk Pretty was the one that I read earlier this year. Casey Wilson's Wreckage of My Presence was an essay one that I read recently. And then the other one I actually kicked the year off with was Min Jin Lee's Free Food for Millionaires, which is one of her first books. Pachinko is the one a lot of people know now, especially because it just got turned into like an Apple TV original. But yeah, Free Food for Millionaires, also beautifully written book. And this is going to sound so bougie. Age of Innocence, don't sleep on it. It is one of the most beautifully written books, the fact that we don't speak or write like that anymore is sort of tragic, but just the turn of phrase is unreal. So I'd highly recommend that too. And they're usually so cheap because you know, it's like basically free to the public now because the book's so old. Excellent. That's a good list. We'll definitely have to check that out. What is a piece of writing advice that you ignore and one that you follow? Ooh, ignore is probably the whole, like, have a routine, you know, like wake up at 530, make your coffee, two hours of uninterrupted writing and creative time. No, I don't function like, first of all, I'm very much not a morning person. Don't function like that at all. I would very much advise folks, particularly where writing is the creative endeavor, that sometimes you do just have to put words on a page. Like it doesn't have to be pretty, just getting ideas out, getting thoughts out, getting sentences out, hitting word count, depending on how you're writing or what you're writing for. It's just kind of critical, just sort of brain dumping, if you will. But I think it's also so important that you learn yourself in that you figure out what is your peak creative times of the day slash night. And try to really be precious about honoring that when you can. Like, you know, I am much more a night person historically that obviously there's ebbs and flows to that depending on what's going on in life. But I love writing late at night. Everything is quiet. There isn't a whole lot of distraction. Even like social media for me is not that active. By the time we get to like midnight or one, so much of my first book were written between the hours about 10.30 p.m. 
till 1.30 a.m. Also because I was working a full-time job and that's when I was like home and free. But I do think it's important to really hone in on what actually works for you and don't feel all this pressure to just be doing it the way like XYZ famous writers have done it. Great, that's what works for them. Doesn't mean that's what works for you. And start to be honest with yourself about the kind of writing that fits you. I think some of us really want to be a certain type of writer, but maybe that's not the best writing that you produce. And being truly honest with yourself about, wow, this is much more in alignment with how I think and write this, this particular style. If you had told 18 year old Aaron, I would be writing basically money self-help books. I would have laughed in your face. Like, I like the idea of writing fiction. I could not believe that I ended up down this path. And so just being open to opportunities, regardless of how they come up in the creative arts is really what I would most encourage people to do. Excellent. Yeah, I definitely agree about, you know, finding your peak creative time. It's so important. Like you said, you know, putting up those boundaries and and being able to have, whether it's a half an hour or five minutes or whatever, because I noticed at least for myself, I get like creatively grumpy. It's like, if I don't have a certain number of creative time every day, I'm not going to be a happy person. (laughs) Yeah, that is a great way to think about it too. And also being mindful of what you're consuming at times when you're trying to be creative in a certain way, this might sound kind of silly, but I often stop reading or consuming content on the topic that I am writing about close to the time that I'm writing it partly because I'm also really afraid that like something will be in the back of my brain. And I think it's a genius idea that I came up with. And then lo and behold, it's something I read somewhere one time. So I think that's part of it, but also that I just don't want to get burned out on a particular idea or topic. If I'm just constantly consuming it in all different facets of my life, to be honest, most of the podcasts I listen to are not money podcasts. Occasionally I'll listen to them. Like I write and read about that all the time. I don't also need to be like thinking about it in my quote unquote downtime. So a follow-up question. Um, what are your favorite and least favorite parts about the creative process? And whether that's with your theater background, writing or a- anything goes. My least favorite part is the administrative tasks required with like getting paid, following up on emails, doing contracts, like just all of the tedious parts of running your own business is exhausting. And I hate that part, but within the creative field, I mean, editing, I don't know that many people that love an edit process. When you have a really great editor, that can be the difference maker because you do feel like your craft is elevating, but when you either aren't necessarily in sync with your editor or You know, I've written pieces before that have been in major publications where it has just gotten so changed and so manipulated and so watered down that I'm like, I don't even want my byline on this anymore because this doesn't sound like me and this doesn't resonate with me. And that I think is a big, huge struggle in the creative process is when your work in whatever shape is kind of just getting twisted to be quote unquote mass consumed as opposed to feeling like it's in alignment with you. And hey, if you go through that once and you're in a financial place to be able to be like, great, I'm just never going to write for them again because that didn't feel good and I didn't like that process. The best part, one, just kind of that, I guess, to borrow a phrase from the artist way, which if you haven't done it, would also highly recommend that kind of synchronicity of you're just doing what you are supposed to be doing and it's clicking. And then for me, that it's serving people and helping other people There is just a true beauty in that process. And I'm not going to lie. I like that I can financially support myself and live a good life in an expensive city doing the work that I do. But I think it's very much worth noting, again, didn't think this was going to be the path, (laughs) didn't expect any of this. And if I had not been open to it, I don't. I don't know what my life would look like now. I don't know that I would be in the financial position I'm in now if I hadn't been, I guess, less precious about my work and my art and the type of creative I was going to be. If I had been really dogmatic about only wanting to achieve success in a particular kind of way, I don't think I would be as successful as I am now. And I don't think I would have helped as many people. 
as I have. And the final thing on this, I would also say, I started all of this, like Broke Millennial as a blog in January of 2003, started as a passion project. Not even, it was a hobby project. I was just bored. Like I was very bored at my day job, wasn't really feeling fulfilled, wanted an opportunity to write. I knew myself, I'm a very carrot stick person. Like I have to have deadlines and I have to have kind of a punishment or a reward system in place. And I was like, okay, I'm going to try to write a blog twice a week, just to, you know, just create some samples that maybe I can leverage into something else in the future. I need a topic. What sounds like a fun topic? Everyone else around me seems super uncomfortable talking about money. I think it's interesting. Let's dig there, see what happens. Truly never expected to monetize, never expected it to turn into any sort of job. It just was this kind of lightning in a bottle situation that happened. And that's not to discredit the fact I put a ton of work and time and effort into it, but it also isn't something that could be just like easily replicated either because I wasn't out there trying to like maximize and juice SEO in order to get affiliates in order to get to the top of the Google algorithm. Like I just was writing for fun. And I think that that really came through. Yeah. Yeah. You brought up some excellent points that, you know, doing something you're passionate about being open-minded to sort of following different paths within the creative field, even if it's not what, you know, someone envisioned since they were a child or exactly what they majored in gives people an opportunity in the creative fields to really explore and tap into their potentials, whether it's something dormant or something that, you know, they could just really follow that they're naturally talented at that they maybe didn't know about and create a life that's still fulfilling in the arts, just in a way that maybe they didn't realize. And to try to be open-minded to the fact that hopefully life is long and what you're doing now in the arts may not be what you're doing in 10, 15, 20, 30 years. And that we can just have so many different lives in this life that just because you are choosing to go down one path now, doesn't mean that you are forever turning your back on this other type of creative person that you wanted to be. And in fact, I would argue, once you have some level of financial stability, it really opens you up to be able to pursue other areas of interest. Yes, I would agree there. I think that sometimes, I guess this would be considered a quote unquote bad thing about the creative arts is that sometimes you need to have privilege or you need to have opportunity or um, a sponsor or a backer or scholarships in order to push forward and succeed because it is very financially difficult, um, not just difficult from a perspective of learning repertoire or anything of that nature, but just physically financially difficult to make it whether it's keeping up with purchasing instruments, practicing, going to expensive schools, taking lessons, having to be a gig worker. And there is a level of privilege that comes with being in the creative field that you don't necessarily see with other fields. That's very true. And, you know, it's a lineage that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years in terms of benefactors. So it's certainly nothing new to today's creatives. I just think that It's interesting how there's been a little bit of a democratization and access because of the internet being able to put your art out there in different ways. But at the same time, there's been such a proliferation of access and also free content that it, to a degree, can dilute the value of our work because people then expect to be able to get access for free. So it's been a little bit of a double-edged sword. It is incredibly difficult, too, to decide when to pivot or when to leave behind a creative project or endeavor. And I guess that's part of why, like, I personally do really resonate a lot with this idea of I can hopefully potentially come back to this, like acting for me, for example, being something that I use that skill a lot when I give talks, but that's certainly not the kind of acting that I wanted to do because that's public speaking and presentations and hones in very well on all the craft that I learned studying theater, but it's not creating a character, going on stage, character development, you know, it's very different. But I do think a lot about like, maybe 55 year old me is going to be the one that's on stage and acting. And to just reframe what the dream is sometimes is very important. And no less frustrating about the privilege part of all of this. But 
there's also just an interesting part about sometimes it's privilege. Sometimes it's hard work means luck and opportunity. And for some people, the luck breaks their way. And for other people, it doesn't. And that's just like an unfortunate reality of being in this field and honestly being in a lot of fields, but especially the creative field. Definitely. Definitely. I think luck has so much to do with it and hard work. It's, it's, it really is, like you said, a double-edged sword for creative people. You know, you can work hard, you can have the talent, you can show up, but things just don't happen. And it doesn't mean you're any less of a human or creative person. Like sometimes it just doesn't work out. And so being open-minded and of course, being able to have like your financial stability there gives people opportunities and, you know, pivoting into financial questions, um, you know, people who work in the creative arts, you know, they often work gigs, maybe they have a good season or a good couple of weeks, but things aren't super stable. What are a few golden nuggets that can help them, especially if you're a, a new graduate, perhaps prepare for a more successful life in the arts? One of the big considerations is figuring out how to try to stabilize your income. And I don't mean go get a traditional job. If you're somebody who works any sort of contract work, gig economy, myself included in this conversation, for me, a huge difference happened when I, first of all, as you should for the sake of taxes, separate your personal income from your, or your personal money from your professional money. So the money that you get paid for doing any work that you do should be going into one bank account, preferably a business bank account, but maybe we're not there yet, but putting it into one bank account and using that to pay yourself a salary as opposed to, hey, it's been a boom month. I made a bunch of money this month. I'm just going to live large this month. And then next month, it's sort of a famine month. And yikes, I'm scrambling and trying to figure things out. For the sake of your sanity, if you can just let during the boom times money accrue in your business checking account, then you can start to consistently pay yourself a salary that's just the same set amount. Now, obviously, it can take some time to get to a point where the booms are enough to sustain you through the downs. But the other thing, too, within that is figuring out within the realm of my skill set, what is a way that I can make money fairly quickly? Obviously, an ethically and lawful way as well. But what is a way that I can quickly make money? What is a skill or a resource? or something I can fall back on and just like kind of have it in the back of your head during those downtimes, but also trying to lay the groundwork for having, whether it's consistent clients, consistent engagements, consistent gigs, but don't overlook setting up multiple streams of income to the best of your ability and trying not to rely on one or two huge clients because if one of them goes away, what then does that look like for the rest of your finances? So for those of us who do earn volatile incomes and variable incomes, trying to just diversify how we make our money is one of the best things we can focus on. What is a financial concept that people in the creative fields tend to misunderstand or need to do better at? You need to invest for retirement. That is such a big one because so many of us do not have the luxury of an employer matched or employer sponsored retirement plan. And so it is entirely on us to figure that out, which can feel really overwhelming and stressful. And I also want to point out the language that I use here because I said invest for retirement, not save for retirement. And I say that because I think so often we do ourselves a disservice when we use the wrong language and save for retirement being the common vernacular that you hear, it's a misnomer. You should not be saving your money for retirement. You absolutely need to be investing your money for retirement. Obviously that feels like not great right now with at the time of this recording, the stock market just doing what it's doing, but it's important to also look at a bird's eye view of how the stock market behaves there are ups and downs. That is part of the process. For those of us who are decades away from retiring, to make a decision like to sell off all of your investments and move it into cash during a down market 
or to even stop investing during a down market can do so much damage to your long-term wealth that it really is pretty critical to stay the course of what you had figured out was going to make the most sense for you. This can also be where talking to a certified financial planner can be really helpful. But for people who are self-employed, particularly, there are a lot of vehicles. There's you know, traditional or Roth IRAs, but those have an actually pretty low contribution limit by comparison to a SEP, SEP IRA or a solo 401k. These are ways that we can really be putting significant chunks of money aside for our futures, especially as you are earning more and more. You know, it's a great goal when you're first starting to try to max out. That means put the most amount of money in that you legally can. A traditional or a Roth IRA, which in 2022, I want to say is $6,500, but the IRS.gov makes it really easy. You'd be shocked how basic plain English the IRS's website is. You would think no, but it's actually very easy to read English. So that to me is a huge one when it comes to creatives is this concept of either I can't afford to right now, which doesn't focus on the acknowledgement that the earlier you start, even with really small amounts of money, significantly better off you are going to be because of having time on your side. It is really hard to play catch up when it comes to your overall financial life. So even 10 years down the road, being able to put in three, five, 10 times what you were able to put in in your early 20s doesn't even necessarily mean you're going to catch up depending on the amounts. Also, hate to tell you this, but life tends to get more complicated, not less. So even if you earn more money, you might have taken on bigger financial obligations. Maybe you got married, maybe you had kids, maybe you bought a house, maybe a family member got sick, maybe you got sick. You know, there's just so many things that can happen. So laying that healthy foundation of investing for retirement early, even if it's very modest sums of money, is incredibly critical, particularly when it's just all on you. And I think the other, I don't want to say lie that we tell ourselves, but narrative, if you will, that a lot of us tend to tell ourselves is, I will hit it big, and then I will have the money to be able to do this. But for so many of us in creative endeavors, you never hit it big, big. You're never going to necessarily be making huge and huge sums of money, but you might be not even beyond surviving. You might be thriving in what you do, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're pulling in millions of dollars off of our work either. So to build a future that is stable for yourself does require laying that foundational work decades in advance, as opposed to trying to scramble and cobble it together in the future. Excellent advice. And I'm, I'm sure something that will be a little bit hard for some people in the creative arts to swallow, especially in this current economic climate, because I, there are, I'm sure so many people maybe working two and three jobs or just living paycheck to paycheck and, you know, hoping they can continue to do their art and do their craft. I think the reality, even in those situations is looking at even putting $5 aside out of every paycheck that you get into and start with a savings account. Like right now I get it. Like it feels so uncertain and with inflation and job security, just focusing on cash savings is a great first step. But a big part of that is the habit. And that's one thing I harp a lot, a lot on for people is that when I first moved to New York, I was working three different jobs, made less than $23,000 a year. So this is all advice that comes from that era of my life and any opportunity that I had to squirrel away a little bit. So for instance, if I was babysitting and I got cab money, I still would take the train home and I would pocket the cab money. I would put it at that time in a little envelope because I was getting paid in cash. And that's the way I was able to save some money. And over the course of that year, I saved about 500 bucks. And I was just, it was some of the most meaningful money I ever saved because of how hard it was to save that money. But it also became so routine and it was such a habit that as my financial life stabilized, 
I was able to just continue to keep saving where sometimes we forget that if we haven't built the habit, it's really hard to switch the mindset in the future. And it's a bit of a lazy correlation, but on the same token, like if we think about if we're just kind of like a Netflix and hang kind of person, and then tomorrow we get an offer to run a half marathon, probably not going to work out in our favor. But if you've been running two miles every other day all year, well, it might not be the best time, but like you could still probably go out and do it. And so I think that that's a big part of it is to drastically try to shift both your mental perception and your habit, not as easy as you would think. And also as you make more money, if you haven't built the foundation, you'll tell yourselves narratives like, I deserve to do X, Y, Z thing because I've struggled for so long and I'll still worry about saving in the future. And that's where we really start to undermine ourselves too. All of this is about balance. And I don't recommend the deprivation mentality I think for some people, you might read personal finance content that's like, you don't deserve to have anything other than rice and beans until you've paid off all of your debt and you have a fully funded emergency savings fund and you're maxing out your retirement plan. No, no, you should have balance. Balance is important, but even starting with a little bit can make a big difference. Excellent advice. And, you know, you touched on something there about mindset that is so important because as people in the creative arts, there's always sort of that hustle struggle, not always knowing, you know, if you're going to get that gig next week, or if you're going to get that seasonal gig every year that pays the big bucks, you know, and, and so sometimes it feels like, okay, well, can I save when I have to go pay this bill or that bill, you know? So like you said, mindset really has a lot to do with it and sitting down and even having a basic budget could probably free up a lot of people's general worries because they can physically see or visually see uh, where their funds are going and where they can try and save, even if it's just that $5. Yeah. And knowing what I like to refer to as your bare essential budget, just having a sense of what is the bare minimum I need to meet my basic needs is a really helpful exercise to run no matter where you are in your financial life. Like that is an exercise that I started funnily enough, right before the pandemic hit where I sat down and I'm married. And so I went through like, okay, how much do we need to pay our rent, pay an average of what our utility bill is at the times we were paying off student loans, minimum payment on those dog food, all of that. Just like, what's all the minimums that we need just to keep going. And having that number when the pandemic hit and my business fell out from under me for a period of time was actually really reassuring because we were able to immediately just pivot and we just scaled back. Like there was zero indulgences during the first about month and a half. And we just purely focused on covering our needs and trying not to drain down savings any more than we had to at that period of time, because we weren't sure when my income was going to go back up. And then obviously once it stabilized again, we started to slowly reintroduce some luxuries into our lives. But I do think that that can be a really useful practice is just to know what is my bare essential budget. And that is also the number that you can use to focus on an emergency savings fund. And I would say that the first goal is to have one month of bare essential living expenses. You will hear the advice to have $1,000. 15 years ago, that was great advice. Well, what does $1,000 cover these days is my question. I, I can't even pay a, well, I could pay a quarter, but I can't pay more than a third of my rent with $1,000. So for people who live in high cost of living areas or who have big debt minimum payments or need to pay for childcare, or that's more than the cost of transportation to and from work. You know, you get it. Point being a thousand bucks usually isn't enough to get you through a big pinch. So just keeping in mind, having that bare essential living expenses number, and that's also the foundation of your emergency fund. What's a common stereotype about finance that you're hoping to break with your work? That you have to be good at math to be good at money. 
hate it. I hate it so much because spoiler, I'm terrible at math, truly terrible to the point that I never even trust myself to do the mental math on tipping someone when I've eaten out because I'm so fearful of ever under tipping, but I always do it on a calculator and always get made fun of because my friends like to say, this is literally your job. And I was like, well, calculating a tip is not my job. Just knowing how to handle money is. <laughs> so that I think is um, a very common misconception that you need to be quote unquote good at math in order to be able to handle your money well. To be honest, being good at money has a lot more to do with psychology than it does with math. Because a lot of this also comes down to how we relate to money, how we think about money, the boundaries that we're willing to set around our money. And if you let money continue to control your life because you're too afraid to confront it, that's a bit more of a psychological problem than a mathematical one. Obviously you need to know some basic math, but spoilers, there's calculators for literally every mathematical thing on the internet. So for instance, if people are talking about debt snowball versus debt avalanche for paying off debt, I want to say it's undebt.it, undebt it website where you just plug in your information and they provide you with information. It's free. You don't have to put a credit card in or anything. They'll be like, hey, here's the way to tackle your debt with either debt snowball or debt avalanche, which are two very common types of methods for paying off debt. Yeah, I know. I've turned to Nerd Wallet on more than one occasion as yep. well. As a, they they have calculators where you actually like for everything imaginable, and then it just turns into almost like fun trying to calculate different stuff. So my favorite one, tying back to the investing, the SEC Securities Exchange Commission has a compound interest calculator. Which if you just Google compound interest calculator, it's usually one of the first three that will hit on your preferred search tool. And I love playing around with that in terms of difference in how much I add a month and what's that going to look like in 30 years. I like, I usually do a 7% average return. So if you are feeling really demoralized about investing for your future, that is a great one to play around with. Excellent. We're going to pivot to some fun, non-financial questions, but being that you have a theater background and you love to act, if you could be cast in any role, what would it be? Oh, this is very hard. So high school Aaron is going to go with like a real cliche classic, which is like Mimi from Rent, because just all bangers of songs in that show that she has. I'm trying to think of what I saw. Honestly, I saw Plaza Suite earlier this year on Broadway. And the female lead in that is just such an unbelievably fun role. And you get to be playing three fully developed different characters over the course of a show, assuming that they don't change actors between the acts. Probably that just gives you a lot of flexibility. And comedy was not so much my forte. So I think it would be a fun challenge. I was more dramatic acting. Ooh, very cool. What is your favorite? film and what does it reveal about you? The real answer to this would be Spike Lee movie called 25th Hour, which stars Edward Norton, Rosario Dawes, Philip Seymour Hoffman. And then now we all finally know him from Succession, Brian Cox, which at the time this came out and I want to say like 2002. And it was actually one of my favorite movies in high school. And it just kind of still has been one of my favorite movies, which I think predates my obsession with New York City. I I feel like it laid a foundation for me wanting to move and live here and has two of my favorite monologues of all time in movies in it. It also um, is a very hard watch, I would say as well. It is not a light movie. The whole premise being it's Edward Norton's character's last day before going to jail and everything that he wants to resolve, all the loose ends he wants to tie up before then. I'll have to look into it because Edward Norton is really brilliant. Yes, he is. And it is a It is set on the backdrop of like a rate post 9-11 New York City. So it's just a very 
intense film and in some ways has not aged well with some of the language that gets used, but the acting is just phenomenal and seeing a lot of powerhouse actors at a very young age by today's comparison is fascinating too. So you live in a very diverse city, which probably has some amazing food. Where would you point a tourist if they were coming? Like what couple of restaurants would you point them to? Well, it depends on what they like, but you need to get off the island of Manhattan if you want some of the best food, which is a controversial statement to a lot of people. But I lived for nine years in Astoria, Queens, which is basically little Greece. So if you want Greek food, you better be going to Astoria. I have a bunch of different recommendations for there. And as somebody who went to Greece this last summer, I was like, oh yeah, like it stacks up. Like this is very authentic food. If you want proper Chinese food, I would say you need to be going to Flushing. So it really kind of depends on what you want. There's some really good Italian, both in Brooklyn and on Staten Island, which a lot of people don't want to necessarily venture out to, but got some great Italian food out there too. So I think that for a visitor to New York, I would highly encourage you to diversify your experience outside of the island of Manhattan. I love that. Diversify your meal portfolio. Yes. (laughs) How am I doing with that lingo? <laughs> Perfect. So proud. There you go. If you could have dinner with any creative person, dead or alive, who would it be? Oh, no. I know these are tougher so than the financial questions. I know. <laughs> they really are. <laughs> they really are. Um, I really love Martin McDonough's work and Sharon Horgan. Um, I love her as both a writer and an actor. So. If I could double down and get both of them for a dinner and just the landscape of TV, film and theater today and also, man, dark comedy. It is just so impressive to me to be able to write and then also particularly for Sharon Horgan to be able to perform in dark comedies. I just feel like it is a one of the most impressive skill sets within the written and performance genres. So yeah, Martin McDonough, Sharon Horgan, I think would be my answers. And final question, in your own words, what does living a creative life mean to you? I would say it's remaining open to what creativity is flowing out of you at the time and trying to recognize that it might not take the forms of the artistic styles or what you would prefer it to manifest as, which is sort of a convoluted way. I'll give an example. Obviously I love theater. I love acting. I consume a lot of theater. I consume a lot of television. And for me, performing in that way would be how I would prefer to have creativity flow out of me and writing. But in the last year, Tap class and crochet have been two things that have been happening in my world. So tap because I wanted to do something that was fairly cheap and got me out of my comfort zone. I'm not a dancer by any stretch of the imagination. And frankly, just routinely get shown up by women who are significantly older than I am in my tap class for absolute beginners that I take. And that is the formal title of that class. But it's It interestingly sparked kind of other types of creativity. And I also tried, have taught myself how to crochet in the last year as well. And again, that's not necessarily an artistic form I ever really would have considered even a couple of years ago, but it's just a way that an artistic sensibility is currently just flowing out of me. And it's something that I like oddly actually turned out to be pretty strong really exclusively with scarves, but Hey, like it's still pretty interesting. So I would just say opening yourself up consistently throughout your life to different types of art than you ever would have thought you would enjoy and to keep going out of your comfort zone. I think for literally every art form, the best stuff is produced when you have pushed and challenged yourself or had a new experience. 
And it is fairly hard to get to those points by consistently just staying in your comfort zone. Excellent. Fantastic points, both financially and from the creative aspect. Erin, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Listeners, please check the show notes to learn more about Erin and be able to access links to purchase her books. And as always, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Like the show? Have a question? Stop by the Facebook and Instagram pages. Links are in the show notes or search for Creative Piecemeal Podcast on social media and click follow for all the latest.